The following program, General Grant Looks at the American Civil War, is a presentation of the Civil War Broadcasting Network. It is one of that series of programs where in General Grant lifts up a person, place, or event in the war for review and reflection. It is available on the free YouTube channel, Dr. E.C. Fields, on Facebook under Kurt Fields as General Ulysses S. Grant, and on other social media. Permission to copy and distribute is granted and, indeed, encouraged. Remember, you are the future of our past. And now, General Grant looks at the American Civil War discussing his promotion to Lieutenant General and then named General-in-Chief. I am Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, and you find me in my library today wishing to reflect with you upon my promotion to Lieutenant General. I am wearing my Major General uniform, battle-worn and dirty, uh, faded, but it is the uniform that I was wearing the night I met President Lincoln at the White House in the East Room. And I thought it appropriate to wear the uniform I wore the first time I met Mr. Lincoln and the circumstances that uh, brought forth my wearing this uniform. Perhaps you'll have a smile. The issue of being promoted to Lieutenant General goes back to the issue of there being no Lieutenant General rank since George Washington. He is the only one in, who in 1798, when we were afraid the French were going to invade us, uh, John Adams uh, worked with Congress and they developed the rank of Lieutenant General and General Washington had it until his death the next year. Uh, Winfield Scott, my longtime uh, idol and hero, uh, had it as a brevet only. He did not hold the full rank. So if I got the rank of Lieutenant General, which I did, I am only the second to hold the rank. But there was much that went on boiling uh, behind the scenes in the rivers of politics of which I want nothing to do that I should like to familiarize you with what was happening. It was not by any means something sudden. On December the 14th of 1863, my uh, supporter, Elihu Washburn, congressman from Galena, Illinois, and uh, Mr. James Doolittle, senator from Wisconsin, jointly sponsored a bill to resurrect the rank of Lieutenant General and uh, Senator, or rather Representative Washburn, Congressman Washburn, introduced uh, House Resolution Number 26 on December the 14th of 1863. He had the honor, indeed wanted the honor, of introducing this legislation, and it reads in part, the bill authorizes the President to appoint by and with the advice and consent of the Senate a lieutenant general to be selected among those officers in the military service of the United States, not below the grade of major general, most distinguished for courage, skill, and ability. So that went into uh, the hopper, so to speak, on December the 14th. There was a great deal of controversy about this, about whether or not to indeed name me specifically, and whether or not that should be done. Well, an amendment was added that did name me specifically in the House version of that passed, but uh, it was strongly objected to by at least 19 congressmen because the bill passed the House on February the 2nd, uh, 117 to 19. But President Lincoln 
was having some difficulties because he thought I had political aspirations. Indeed, he was surrounded with generals that had political aspirations and men who wanted to be the president. And remember, in the uh, end of 1863, the first of 1864, the war was not going well at all. And President Lincoln was greatly concerned that he would not be reelected, indeed, not even renominated at the party convention in the summer of 64. And he was wont to nominate me uh, to get a third star because he didn't want to create a another strong rival for the presidency. And he had no idea how I felt. <clears throat> a couple of letters that I wrote in that time frame, though, I think helped alleviate the president. On January the 13th, uh, Admiral Porter, a good friend of mine, wrote a letter to Gustavus Fox, the brother-in-law of Frank Blair, Major General Frank Blair. The Blairs are a, a uh, strong political family in St. Louis and in Washington. And Gustavus Fox is the brother-in-law of Frank Blair. Admiral Porter wrote him uh, this letter on January 13th of 1864, saying, Grant could not be kicked into the presidency. He would not have it at 40000 per year. He don't like anything but fighting and smoking. And he hates politics as the devil does holy water. He don't want even to be a lieutenant general until the war is over. So having no aspirations of a political nature, he should have as big a command as he can manage. And the success of the next year depends on his having all the Mississippi. It is indeed a necessity. And I don't like anything but fighting and smoking. Well, that went to Gus Fox, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. It went to Frank Blair, and it gets into, into the White House. But at the, at the time, the Democrats were looking for a candidate to run against Lincoln, as the Republicans were looking for a candidate to run against Lincoln. And uh, Isaac N. Morris, who was a, a, a hater of Lincoln, an implacable foe, and active in politics, sent me a letter inquiring if I would run for the presidency. And I responded to uh, Mr. Morris in this way. In your letter, you say I have it in my power to be the next president. This is the last thing in the world I desire. I would regard such a consummation as being highly unfortunate for myself, if not for the country. Through providence, I have attained more than I had ever hoped and infinitely prefer my present position to that of any civil office within the gift of the people. And I hope that gets to President Lincoln. Some more background. The, the country, Congress and the President particularly, were not happy with General Meade. He had let Lee slip through his, President Lincoln said, he had Lee within his grasp and he let him slip through his fingers. My victory at Vicksburg was hailed and lauded uh, still, but there was much talk of transferring uh, Meade to the South or perhaps into the Washington area and demoting him, bringing me in to be the commander of the AOP, Army of the Potomac. Well, that's a graveyard for generals, and I wanted no part of that. Halleck did not want that for me, and, and another ally that I found out about was Charles A. Dana, who had been indeed sent to spy on me during the Vicksburg campaign to see if I was the, the drunk I'm supposed to be, and what I did and how I did it. He and Halleck both strongly supported me staying in the West, not being brought in to be commander of the Army of the Potomac. The talk of being a lieutenant general uh, is becoming stronger. Indeed, uh, the New York Herald is uh, leading a campaign to name Grant uh, for president. And this clamoring is becoming ever louder. 
And I, the president is perplexed. Through all of this, the, the entire month of February, when the bill was being debated first in the House, then in the Senate, President Lincoln was silent. He said nothing. Because, as I pointed out earlier, he's surrounded by men who want to be president. He's concerned he's not going to be reelected. He knows my popularity in the country, and he does not want to give me a third star, only to have it lead to me ousting him from the executive mansion. So he says nothing. Indeed, he, in this time frame, restored John McClernand to a command in Louisiana. Now, I could take that as a slap in the face. My supporters certainly do and tell me I should take it as such. I do not, however. The president may do as he wishes and I don't have to contend with General McClernand. And I know that the president and General McClernand are longtime good friends, so I have nothing to say on that. Certainly no criticism. I take note, though, that the president has said nothing. He does appoint a former rival to restore him to commander after I had relieved him of command after Vicksburg. So you see, there's also the question of lieutenant general. The lieutenant general is not by law automatically the general in chief. There are two separate statuses. And if I get the general, uh, the lieutenant general promotion, and there, there was little doubt that I would get it. As I said, the House version initially had me named specifically uh, that would I be the general of the armies or would I simply be the ranking general to direct all generals below me who are of the major general rank? And uh, on February the 26th, Congressman Washburn sent me the letter, the Lieutenant General Bill has passed both houses of Congress today. The appointment will probably be made next week. I should like to tell you a couple of things though. When the bill was introduced on December the 14th, uh, Senator Doolittle uh, lauded me greatly. He said, General Grant has uh, won 17 battles. He's taken more than 100,000 prisoners and captured more than 500 enemy cannon. Uh, and I, I expect I have done all of that. And the initial bill was amended to name me specifically. Now, when that went to the Senate, now it passed the House 119 to 17, or correction, 117 to 19. So now, when it went to the Senate, they struck, their version struck that from the bill, and they debated it back and forth. If that, why not wait till the war's over and award whoever does the best? Why do we have to have the duality of Lieutenant General and not General in Chief? Why do we have to name Grant? And they also, the Senate took that uh, amendment naming me specifically for two good reasons. The first being that naming me specifically took away or usurped the President's uh, power, prerogative to appoint whomever he chooses. And it also simultaneously takes away the power of the Senate to advise and consent in the Constitution. If the person's name, the Senate can't approve it. So that was struck, it was sent back to the House, a committee bill hammered out uh, that the rank was indeed resurrected and it passed the Senate 31 to six. So again, not everybody was in favor of me getting that. Uh, uh, Senator Sumner was one of those people opposing it. On February the 26th, it was approved. It was sent to President Lincoln on leap year day, February the 29th. He immediately signed it, said one sentence, I appoint Major General Ulysses S. Grant to the rank of Lieutenant General, sent it back to the Senate by the same messenger, they got it on March the 1st, they approved it on March the 2nd. The rank was resurrected. I had been 
nominated and approved on March the 2nd. On February the 29th, President Lincoln had written, I nominate Ulysses S. Grant, now a Major General in the Military Service, to be Lieutenant General in the Army of the United States. March the 2nd, I was in. But on February the 28th, what had really clinched President Lincoln, assuaged President Lincoln's mind and clinched it was this letter I wrote Frank Blair, uh, Major General Frank Blair, the Blair family of St. Louis. Nashville, Tennessee, February the 28th, 1864. My dear General, and he had written me a letter inquiring about my status, do I want to be the president? Your letter of the 16th instant is but just received. It is on a subject which I do not like to write, talk, or think. Everybody who knows me knows I have no political aspirations either now or for the future. I hope to remain a soldier as long as I live, to serve faithfully any and every administration that may be in power and which may be striving to maintain the integrity of the whole union as long as I do live. However far the powers that might that be choose to extend my authority, I will always endeavor to realize their expectations of me. However much my command may be reduced, I will serve with the same fidelity and zeal. Under no circumstances would I use power for political advancement, nor whilst a soldier take part in politics. If in the conventions to meet, one candidate should be nominated whose election I would regard as dangerous to the country, I would not hesitate to say so freely. Further than this, I could take no part. Admiral Porter, in writing to Assistant Secretary Fox, has probably obtained his information from Sherman. Sherman knows my views exactly. On the subject of the Lieutenant General General C, however, he has not exactly caught my idea. When the bill reviving that grade was first proposed, I did express doubts as to the effect such a measure might have on my influence over those over whom I might have to command, and who, after all, have all the fighting to do. Rather than to loose the least power to do good, towards crushing out the rebellion in the shortest possible time, I would prefer remaining as I am. I also stated that under no circumstances could I be induced to take an office which would require me to stay in Washington and command whilst the armies were in the field. I hope you will show this letter to no one, unless it be the president himself. I hate to see my name associated with politics either as an aspirant for office or as a partisan. Write to me again. Sincerely, your friend, U.S. Grant. The issues that had come to the fore were, would I take the command of the Army of the Potomac? Would I have to command in the field? And would my name be specifically in the legislation? Well, those items were, and did I want to run for the presidency? I clearly, I made that clear. It was also worked out I would not be named the commander of the Army of the Potomac. I would not have to command in the field if I took the command. So behind the scenes, my desires and preferences were addressed. The president's mind was asked ways about me being a political rival. Now, General Halleck wrote me a letter on March the 1st because my moving up would create a ripple effect through the command structure. Your promotion to Lieutenant General seat, which I presume will be immediately made, will create a vacancy of Major General in the regular Army. There are plenty of applicants for it, and these applications will be accompanied by much political intriguing and wire pulling. This is why I chose to share this with you. In my opinion, the place should be given to W.T. Sherman or G.H. Thomas. To the former, I would say decidedly, if he succeeds in his present expedition, the Meridian expedition. A recommendation from you, strongly urged by the military authorities here, 
may be able to overcome the political influences that will be brought to bear in favor of others. I hope that you will give the matter your early consideration. Your letter in regard to McPherson assisted us very much, and he was confirmed yesterday. I had nominated uh, McPherson to take command of the Army of the Tennessee and to replace Sherman, who was moved to commander of the Western Theater. Now, I wrote this letter to General Sherman on March the 4th. I knew that I'd been named and confirmed. The bill reviving the grade of Lieutenant General in the Army has become a law and my name has been sent to the Senate for the place. I now receive orders to report to Washington in person immediately, which indicates either a confirmation or the likelihood of confirmation. I start in the morning to comply with the order, but I shall say very distinctly on my arrival there that I will accept no appointment which will require me to make that city my headquarters. This, however, is not what I started to write about. Whilst I have been eminently successful in this war in at least gaining the confidence of the public, no one feels more than me how much of this success is due to the energy, skill, and harmonious putting forth of that energy and skill of those who it has been my good fortune to have occupying a subordinate position below me. There are many officers to whom these remarks are applicable to a greater or lesser degree, proportionate to their ability as soldiers. But what I want is to express my thanks to you and McPherson as the men to whom, above all others, I feel indebted for whatever I have had of success. How far your advice and suggestions have been of assistance, you know. How far your execution of whatever has been given you to do entitles you to the reward I am receiving you cannot know as well as me. I feel all the gratitude this letter would express, giving it the most flattering construction. The word you I use in the plural intending it for McPherson also. I should write to him but will someday. Starting in the morning I do not know that I will find time just now. Your friend, U.S. Grant, Major General. I sent that heartfelt letter to Sherman. Now Sherman sent a letter back to me in reply that I got after I had the ceremony with President Lincoln. Near Memphis, March the 10th, 1864. Private and confidential. He had this hand delivered by a messenger. I have your more than kind and characteristic letter of the fourth. I will send a copy to General McPherson at once. You do yourself injustice and much too much honor in assigning to us so large a share of the merits which have led to your high advancement. I know you approve the friendship I have ever professed to you and permit me to continue as heretofore to manifest it on all occasions. You are now Washington's legitimate successor and occupy a position of almost dangerous elevation. But if you can continue as heretofore to be yourself, simple, honest, and unpretending, you will enjoy through life the respect and love of friends and the homage of millions of human beings that will award to you a large share in securing to them and their descendants a government of law and stability. I repeat, you do General McPherson and myself too much honor. At Belmont, you manifested your traits, neither of us being near. At Donaldson also, you illustrated your whole character. I was not near and General McPherson in too subordinate a capacity to influence you. Until you had won Donaldson, I confess, I was almost cowed by the terrible array of anarchical elements that presented themselves at every point but that victory admitted the ray of light which I have followed ever since. I believe you are as brave, patriotic, and just as the great prototype Washington, as unselfish, kind-hearted, and honest as a man should be, but the chief characteristic in your nature is the simple faith in success you have always manifested, which I can liken to nothing else than 
the faith a Christian has in a Savior. This faith gave you victory at Shiloh and Vicksburg. Also, when you have completed your best preparations, you go into battle without hesitation. As at Chattanooga, no doubts, no reserve. And I tell you that it was this that made us act with confidence. I knew wherever I was that you thought of me, and if I got in a tight place, you would come if alive. My early points of doubt were in your knowledge of grand strategy and books of science and history. But I confess, your common sense seems to have supplied all of these. Now as to the future, don't stay in Washington. Halleck is better qualified than you are to stand the buffets of intrigue and policy. Come out west. Let us make the whole Mississippi Valley dead sure. And I tell you, the Atlantic Slope and Pacific Shores will follow its destiny as sure as the limbs of a tree live or die with the trunk. We have done much, but much still remains to be done. Time and time's influences are all with us. We could almost afford to sit still and let these influences work. Even in the seceded states, your word now would go further than a president's proclamation or an act of Congress. For God's sake and for your country's sake, come out of Washington. I foretold to General Halleck before he left Corinth the inevitable result to him, and I now exhort you to come out west. Here lies the seat of the coming empire, and from the west when our task is done, we will make short work of Charleston and Richmond and the impoverished coast of the Atlantic. I got to Washington on the afternoon of March the 8th with Fred, my 13-year-old. I had on a linen duster and this uniform. I had a nicer uniform, but this is what I was wearing. And we checked into Willard's Hotel. We walked the several blocks to Willard's Hotel. Clerk uh, had me sign in. I had on the linen duster and I turned the register around. I'd written Grant and Son and took off the coat and he saw my shoulder straps and recognized the name and ejaculated, my God, you're General Grant, not the General Grant. And everybody in the dining room in the lobby immediately looked and some stood up, began cheering, wanting to shake my hand and so forth. But he had given me a room. He said, the best I've got is an attic room, a garret. Will that be all right? And I said, yes, that'll be fine. But when he saw who I was, he uh, said, I've got another room for you. He had five federal officers ejected from the, uh, it was Parlor 6. It was, a, I believe, even a honeymoon bridal suite. It was the same room President and Mrs. Lincoln stayed in while he was waiting for his inauguration. And those five officers were creating quite a ruckus until they came into the lobby and saw me. And then they became very uh, accommodating and said they were happy to give up their room for me. I would have been happy with the garret I had and let them stay where they were. Uh, Fred and I went out, had a little bit to eat. I wanted to show him a little bit of the city. We came back. I had a note from the White House that said the president was having a levy and would like for me to come over, if possible. Of course, it was possible. I put Fred to bed, made sure he was attended to, and walked to the White House. And Washington is a sewer. Uh, it really is a sewer. And I had on my shoes, and quite a bit of uh, awful on my shoes. And I was wearing this uniform. I was not expecting to go to a levee at the White House and meet the president. We met. Uh, the people wanted to uh, see me. I was spending a very uh, pleasant few minutes with Mrs. Lincoln. And she said, General, I believe the people want to see you. And Secretary Seward actually insisted I stand on a sofa, a, new, a red chintz sofa that I believe Mrs. Lincoln had just had refinished. And with what I had on my shoes, it would need to be refinished again. I stood there for quite some time shaking hands and not really knowing what to do. And after uh, a respectable time, President Lincoln 
took me into a side room and he said, General, uh, I'm going to give you my statement that I'm going to make tomorrow so you may prepare appropriate responses. I would like for you to try to ask ways the feelings of an army, the Potomac particularly, that uh, may resent you being brought in from the West and with the attitude, uh, overcome the attitude of, well, come on and show us how it's done. So if you would write something to try to assuage and, and instill a positive attitude rather toward your becoming the commanding general of the, all the armies. And I went back to Willard's and wrote my brief statement. Now the president, the morning of the 9th, we went to the uh, meeting and the cabinet was there. Three of my staff officers were there. Halleck was there and uh, my son Fred was with us to see that. President Lincoln said, the nation's appreciation of what you have done and its reliance upon you for what remains to do in the existing great struggle are now presented with this commission, constituting you Lieutenant General in the Army of the United States. With this high honor devolves upon you also a corresponding responsibility as the country herein trusts you, so under God it will sustain you. I scarcely need to add that with what I here speak for the nation goes my own hearty personal concurrence. It was only 84 words. I pulled out of this pocket my folded up little rumple pencil and statement, or rather statement written in pencil, and my acceptance was, I accept the commission with gratitude for the high honor conferred. With the aid of the noble armies that have fought on so many fields for our common country, it will be my earnest endeavor not to disappoint your expectations. I feel the full weight of the responsibilities now devolving on me and know that if they are met, it will be due to those armies and above all to the favor of that providence which leads both nations and men. And my acceptance was only 81 words. But being made Lieutenant General did not automatically make me General-in-Chief, Henry Halleck was General-in-Chief, but after the appointment on March the 10th, this was issued uh, to the armies on March the 17th, but on March the 10th, President Lincoln wrote this order, Executive Mansion, Washington, D.C., March 10th, 1864, under the authority of the Act of Congress to revive the grade of Lieutenant General in the United States Army, approved February 29th, 1864. Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, USA, is assigned to the command of the armies of the United States. So I was in command of all armies of the United States. And I wrote this order. I assume command of the armies of the United States. Headquarters will be in the field. And until further orders, will be with the Army of the Potomac. There will be an office headquarters in Washington, D.C., to which all official communications will be sent, except those from the Army where the headquarters are at the date of their address, U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General, USA. So there is the story of what happened and how it happened with some of the swirling, often raging back currents of policies and politics of which Sherman had warned me. And the more or less agreement that I wouldn't have to stay in Washington, that I would not become commander of the Army of the Potomac, and that I would be in the field commanding. And there you have the story behind my promotion to Lieutenant General. And I'd like to remind you that I wore my 
battered and care worn major general uniform that has served me well in memory and in honor of having gotten the rank of lieutenant general the first since george washington but i have said enough for this reflection and for the moment and until we come together again i am lieutenant general ulysses s grant commanding united states armies bidding you an affectionate farewell.